Since our humble beginnings as a small family business, Skyward has evolved into a global technology leader serving more than 2,000 school districts. At Skyward, we are proud to support the initiatives of the Green and Healthy Schools Classroom Learning Series. Welcome everyone to this week's Classroom Learning Series presentation. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Leslie with Green and Healthy Schools Wisconsin. Uh, Presenting today are Allison Bender and Alana Rapp. Allison joined the Wisconsin Energy Institute in 2018 as an outreach coordinator. She has a background in environmental education and worked as a naturalist in state parks across of Wisconsin and Minnesota. After completing a bachelor's in environmental studies at St. Olaf in 2017, she served as an AmeriCorps member in the Minnesota Green Corps program. At the Wisconsin Energy Institute, Allison coordinates a wide variety of educational programming and works with scientists and researchers to translate their work into hands-on activities, lessons, and events for learners of all ages. Alana is a senior at UW-Madison, majoring in environmental science and German, and she is an intern at the Wisconsin Energy Institute. So welcome both of you today, and let's start learning about bioenergy. Thanks for having us today. Thank you for taking the time to join us. Um, like she said, Alana and I both work at the Wisconsin Energy Institute that's at the UW-Madison campus, even though we are both tuning into you from our homes today. The Energy Institute isn't just this building, it's also a network of over 160 scientists and researchers who are studying all different types of energy, from how we make it and get it to where we use it with microgrids to sustainable biofuels, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, if you're familiar with UW-Madison at all, um, I wanted to point out where we're located. We're just about a block away from Camp Randall Stadium, if you're familiar with that. And I also wanted to note that the Wisconsin Energy Institute and all of UW-Madison are located on traditional Ho-Chunk land. The Ho-Chunk people have lived here since time immemorial, and they call this area De Joke. And it's important to know that the Ho-Chunk Nation and the 11 other First Nations in present-day Wisconsin remain vibrant and strong, and that Indigenous people are doing some of the leading and most important work in transitioning away from fossil fuels. I also wanted to introduce you to the Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center. This is a large research center with almost 400 scientists that's funded by the federal government, by the Department of Energy. And uh, UW-Madison scientists make up the greatest share of the people who are working in, together in this research center. And um, we're figuring out how to make sustainable biofuels from plants grown in the field, how to break them down, how to ferment that into fuels and many other pro products. So you're gonna get a little bit of a taste of that today with the experiment that we're gonna do. So our plan for today is to give you a little bit of context for our experiment. Then Alana is gonna take it from there and show you how to set up an experiment that we'll be doing. Um, we're gonna make some observations, talk about what we see and why, and then we'll have time for Q&A at the end. If you registered for this ahead of time and have the PDF that was emailed to you, you can set that, um, have that as a reference. We'll be walking through each of the steps, but you can have that with you too. And if you don't have the supplies to follow along at home, that's okay. You will be doing an experiment from our end and you can follow along with us. So to start, um, I wanted to think about transportation. Maybe if you're on the Zoom call or if you're on YouTube, you can put into the chat how many of you, you can raise your hand, have used one of these cars or trucks? Have you had a product shipped to you that maybe came from across the sea in another country? You can see that without a lot of thinking, even though we are staying safer at home, not, of us, not a lot of us are doing a lot of traveling, transportation is still such an integral part of our daily lives. And we think about where is the fuel coming for all of these vehicles? When I ask this question, sometimes people tell me the gas station, which is true, but I want you guys to think a couple steps further back, where is that fuel coming from? And that brings us here. This is a picture of some large oil drilling rigs, um, machines that are extracting or pulling up petroleum from under the ground. Um, we also call, we all have the word uh, petroleum also, um, we also use the word oil for petroleum. It's um, a, a fuel that is so important. We use it to make gasoline and diesel for our cars and trucks, 
but also so many other products like medicine, like um, plastics, like the polyester fabric in so many of our clothes. And petroleum is a fossil fuel. It's plants like animal, uh, plants and algae that under the earth, under um, the ocean, settled to the bottom and over millions of years with heat and pressure have compressed into the fossil fuel that we pull up and use today. And when we're thinking about petroleum, we know that there's a, a problem with it. So if anybody knows what this means, this is the, the formula for carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas or a heat trapping gas. And to give us a little context, I'm gonna back us up even further to think about what is going on with the greenhouse effect. So we've got the earth and we've got the sun sending solar radiation, heat and light down, warming the planet. A lot of that is going through the atmosphere, warming the earth, and some of that light and heat is radiated back off out towards space. But what happens is the atmosphere full of gases like carbon dioxide, like methane, nitrous oxide, and water vapor kind of acts like a heat trapping blanket to hold in some of that heat. So we see light and heat coming down, some of it bouncing back out, and some of it trapping and staying underneath the atmosphere, warming the earth. And is this a problem? It's not necessarily a problem as it is. Our planet actually would not be livable without our atmospheres, gases, and the greenhouse effect keeping the temperature just right for life on earth. But what is the problem is when we humans have kind of changed the balance of the gases in the atmosphere. And that's what we've been doing when we are extracting that oil and burning fossil fuels and releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. We're adding gases into this layer. It's kind of like we're adding another blanket on top, keeping more heat in. So that's the situation, that's our context for what we're gonna be thinking about today. When we're thinking about all these additional greenhouse gases that we've put into the atmosphere, wanted to give you a, a brief big picture of where these gases are coming from. So you can see this pie chart on the right here. This is put together by the EPA and you can see the way we make electricity matters, how we have our, our businesses and our homes and our buildings and the way we use land. But the biggest piece of the puzzle right here is transportation. So we're going back, coming full circle to thinking about those cars and those trucks, the big jets and the huge shipping and cargo ships that we use to send products all over the world. So what if, what if we could make a fuel out of something that is removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? Can anybody think of something that does already do this, does already move carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? Plants. Plants have this amazing ability. How do they do it? Photosynthesis. So for the high schoolers who are on here today, this might be a review. You might have seen this equation here before, but what we wanna note is that plants in this amazing process take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere with water and light, they convert it into glucose or the sugars that makes up the body and the structure of the plant. Also, they release oxygen into the atmosphere and, and water as well. So we're thinking about this ability of plants to take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere right now and to convert it and to hold it into their bodies. So if we used this as a structure for thinking about biofuels, you can imagine the plants that are growing, taking in carbon dioxide, and then we can break those plants down, grab the sugar from that, convert the sugars into biofuels, and use that to fuel our transportation. Instead of using that old carbon in, that was sequestered in the fossil fuels that we were talking about, pressed into petroleum over millions of years, instead of digging that up, and releasing that carbon into the atmosphere, the plants can take carbon that's currently in the atmosphere and it's a full circle. We might call this carbon neutral. Even better would be if we could figure out a way to have the system, the cycle be carbon negative. Maybe that means these plants are growing year after year and as they take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, they're sequestering it down to the roots into the soil so that the amount of carbon that's being released when we burn the fuels is less than the amount of carbon that's taken in um, 
when the plant is growing. So this is our, our challenge. This is sort of our, our motivation to figure out a way that we can have a fuel that isn't putting more carbon into the atmosphere. And we're not going to do it alone. You maybe have seen this something like this before. This is a picture of a microbe. Um, and specifically, this is a, pic a picture of yeast and baker's yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So what's incredible here is our scientists in the research center are using this yeast that you might be familiar with and you might even have in your kitchen. And if you got the supplies for our experiment today, maybe have some on hand with you right now. So the same yeast that humans have been using for thousands of years to make bread, to make wine, is what our scientists are using to make biofuels. And it's because yeast has this really special, really awesome ability um, uh, called fermentation. The yeast can take sugar, can take a food, and chemically convert that into a fuel and converts it into ethanol. And when it does so, it also produces carbon dioxide. So we're going to be learning a little bit about this process through a hands-on experiment today. So I'm going to pass it over to Alana, who is going to take it from here. And hopefully um, this is what you've been waiting for. <laughs> All right. Well, so the next part of what we'll be doing today then, now that we've talked about kind of the background behind um, biofuel making. So in order to understand better the effects of yeast in this process of creating biofuels, we want to set up an experiment ourselves to be able to view what is going on when we combine these three different things, yeast, some sort of feedstock, and warm water. So here are the materials that we'll need in this experiment. So again, yeast and then warm water, just however hot your tap gets would be great. And then one teaspoon measuring spoons to be able to measure out the yeast and the feedstock, as well as a fourth cup measuring cup for the water. And then these are some possible feedstocks that you guys could use. If you have more than one of these, that's fantastic. And you can grab those. If you haven't already gathered them, we can give you guys a moment now to collect those. Um, and then you'll need some sort of Ziploc bag like this, for example, um, that has some sort of kind of closing mechanism at the top and is sealable, and then maybe paper towels in case there's a bit of a spill or anything while we're doing this. So. so the feedstock is the term that we use for the different sort of food sources that we will be feeding the yeast to see which one it um, does best with and which one will create the most and like the best fermentation. So here are some options again um, that we just mentioned, sugar, cornmeal, sawdust, leaves and stems, anything that you find outside that you could grind up. You have to kind of grind it up to make it a bit smaller. Otherwise, it's not as easy for the yeast to digest. Or you could be creative and use something like cereal um, or something that you have in your kitchen like that, that you could also grind up. And it would be a teaspoon of each that you would need. So again, um, if there's something that you need to grab, you can do that. Maybe you guys already have these near you. Um, if you can get more than one, that would be super great because then we can compare how the yeast reacts differently with each of them. Um, so for example, I have sugar, cornmeal, and sawdust today next to me that I put into a bag a little bit ago so we can view that uh, later to see how that has progressed along with viewing the ones that you guys set up now. Um, yes, so now that we know that we will be from fermenting, excuse me, different types of food sources. Um, this is kind of the big question that we're after, which is which feedstock will the yeast ferment the best? So do you guys, if you guys have any ideas out of the, the ones that we listed just previously, go ahead and you could type those in the chat. Which one do you think that the yeast will do best with? Sugar, cornmeal, uh, sawdust, leaves, cereal? Is there anything that sticks out to you that you think would be um, kind of being the best option for the yeast. And if not, that's also totally okay. It's uh, difficult sometimes with experiments to have much of an idea ahead of time before you've been able to observe the phenomenon at play, what you imagine will happen. However, that is one of the reasons that um, scientists perform experiments is to answer questions. So um, it's totally okay if the answer right now is not something that we know because the experiment is what will help us determine that and view the phenomenon at play. So 
All right, now we will, I will set one of these bags up with you guys so that we can do it together. So you'll need to open up your plastic bag and then grab your teaspoon measure. And then you can grab the yeast first if you have it. Looks something like this for me, just dry baker's yeast. And then we'll be taking one teaspoon of that and just plopping that right into that Ziploc bag. Just trying not to spill. So here I've got the yeast in there. And now we will be taking one teaspoon of your feedstock, whatever it is that you have been able to scrounge up and we'll make a different bag with each one. So only one feedstock goes in each bag. Um, so I will put some feedstock in here now. And now I have both the yeast and the feedstock in there. And then finally, you just need a fourth a cup of warm water. And this is the part where the paper towels might come in handy. But of course, do your best not to spill. All right. And then once you've got all of that in there, you just want to make sure you seal the bag and try and get as much air out of it as possible um, to begin with here. And then just make a tight seal across the top. And it'll look something like this. Not the most appetizing, but definitely interesting uh, to see what will happen with it. So you can also, yeah, um, kind of mix it around a little bit to make sure that the yeast and the feedstock is evenly distributed in the water. And then you want to do the same process now with any other feedstocks that you are able to grab. And um, it might be useful if you are able to get a few different feedstocks to um, label a piece of paper and, and then you can set the bags on them. So for example, you could divide it into fourths like this and then label it with the different feedstocks that you used. And then you can just set the the bags that you made on those squares so that you can keep them apart. Um, kind of a way to label the different ones that you have. So we'll give you guys just a moment here as you're setting up the other feedstocks that you have. Um, again, if you found anything creative in your kitchen, feel free to just try it. This is a very safe experiment and you can't, you're not going to hurt anything by trying a different type of food source if you're curious to see what will happen, which is what science is all about, right? Is curiosity and trying to answer these interesting questions that we have. And we'd love to know if you wanna put in the chat or in the comments, what feedstocks you are working with today. We'd love to hear. I see um, somebody just answered that they have sugar and cracker crumbs. That's a great idea. Definitely um, good if you can grind those up a bit, even if you just put them in the bag first and then maybe kind of use the palm of your hand to just kind of grind them up a bit before you add um, the water to it as well. But that will be interesting to see how that how that works with the yeast then. Awesome. So here is another uh, visual of that paper that I just mentioned that could help you organize your different feedstock types if you have a multiple um, Okay, so now that we have set up our experiment, the next step for us will be to make a hypothesis. So do any of you guys have an idea of what a hypothesis is or why it might be important? Why do most scientists begin an experiment with a hypothesis? And just to give some context, a hypothesis is sort of like a question that we are asking um, and that we seek to answer in our experiment. So basically the most important thing with it is to be able to kind of set up um, in a clear statement what we are looking for so that we can have a good idea of what we will be seeking to understand out of our results and also just to frame our question um, that we're seeking to answer in the experiment. So they're very important to scientists to be able to kind of, yeah, it's, it's sort of a guess of what you imagine will happen. So it's, it's asking the question and giving sort of a, an answer that you think um, could possibly explain it and that you might be witnessing as you conduct your experiment. So a common, a common sort of setup for it is the if-then statement. So you can say, 
for example, with this, if we create multiple different bags with a few different feedstocks um, to observe the effects of yeast on them, then we expect that feedstock X will be the most successful. So you could fill that in, whether you think it would be your cracker crumbs or your cornmeal or your sugar. Um, that way we have sort of a framework to understand the relationship between the variables that we're studying and um, kind of lay out the question and a potential answer that we see. So we did just begin this. So it could very well be that not a whole lot has begun to happen yet in our bags. However, um, if you guys do see something worth noting, it'd be a great time to make some original sort of observations now about your different feedstocks and what you see going on. So feel free to just jot down a few notes, maybe on that piece of paper or else on another scratch piece of paper of what you're seeing going on right now. And while we make these observations, I think this is a good point for us to reconsider the big question that Alana introduced for us at the beginning too, when we were thinking, which feedstock will the yeast ferment the best? Well, how do we know what the best really means in this context? So you can use your observations. Maybe you're seeing something that's uniquely happening in one bag or another, or the color is changing, or maybe um, you're starting to, to notice something else these questions can help you clarify what does it mean to have the best. And while our, while our fermentation is happening, um, and we know that we're going through this really fast, and so even after this presentation, you'll probably notice some more changes in your bags, we wanted to pause and ask, isn't there already a biofuel that we know of that's already being used in a lot of places around the US. So if you know of one, put it in the chat or just tell it to your friend who's next to you. Maybe some of you have thought of this, this is ethanol. Ethanol, you can see it on the picture on the right here is a clear colorless liquid. This is a picture of an ethanol plant in Wisconsin, not too far from where we are here in Madison right now. And ethanol in Wisconsin is primarily made from corn. And you might be wondering, why aren't we talking about this? Why aren't we talking about this as a common biofuel? Why doesn't our research center study corn ethanol? And there's a lot of reasons. One, primarily because corn ethanol is already being used at mass scale. So almost, almost all of the gasoline that you'll go and get at the gas station has about 10% of ethanol in it. And corn ethanol is so widely used that almost 25% of all the corn grown in the U.S. goes towards making ethanol. But if we're thinking about that, and we're thinking about all the acreage of land that's being used to make that corn ethanol, we might come up with some sustainability questions or concerns. So we're thinking about growing all that corn. Corn is an annual plant. That means it has to be planted every year, year after year. And so that takes a lot of fuel to do that, a lot of resources, those tractors driving across the field to plant and to harvest the corn. Another thing about corn being an annual plant is that it doesn't get those rich, deep root systems that some perennial plants or plants that grow back year after year do have. So not having large, deep roots means that the, the crop perhaps isn't as drought resistant than one that does have deeper roots. Also, corn takes a lot of resources, it needs a lot of fertilizer and other nutrients to be able to grow well. So when we're thinking about these things and we're thinking about, okay, we want a biofuel, and yes, we do want it to be made from a plant because corn, you bet, is definitely taking in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as it grows. We have sort of these sustainability questions about how sustainable is it for corn to grow? How much resources does it take and, and farmers time and effort to plant and grow? And then there's this other side of things um, that corn actually can be used for food. So we don't want, when we're thinking about making fuels and other products, we won't want to take away any valuable agricultural land that could be used to grow food for people or animals. Um, and we want to be careful that our, our resources and, and where we um, put effort and energy is thoughtful about this. 
So there's this whole food versus fuel debate. I want to come back to your experiment now. I know that things have, we haven't given you a lot of time for things to happen, but if you can look back at your bags and notice if anything is changing, mark that down on your data table in your sheet. If you have any questions, feel free to also be putting those into the chat for us. And for example, with my bag that I just set up as we were doing it together right now, I don't see a whole lot going on yet, but I do see the formation of some small bubbles at the top that maybe that probably weren't there initially, um, not that I observed anyway. So that would be something that if you see that happening, you can make note of that um, on your sheet of paper. All right, given the amount of time we have, we're going to fast forward. So I know that your reactions probably aren't at this point yet, but what would we see if we had an extra 15, 20 minutes? And I started mine a little bit earlier. So I'm going to hold my bag up to the camera. You can see this is my sugar bag. And in comparison to the cornmeal and the leaves I started, the sugar is the only one that's really starting to fill up. You can see there's a lot of bubbles, like Alana mentioned, she was starting to see there's a lot of gas that's filling up in the bag. So we're seeing that the yeast in, in, the, in the sugar bag is actually fermenting it. And as it ferments, if you remember, it makes those two things. It makes ethanol and it makes carbon dioxide. So as the yeast is able to ferment and process that food that we gave it, our bag is starting to expand. Why is that happening? It all has to do with the chemical structure of the food that we gave it. So if you're thinking about basic table sugar, and this is what I put in my bag, just cane sugar from my kitchen, what we're talking about is glucose, a basic monomer here. And the yeast is designed to be able to ferment, to be able to digest that sugar. That's what it's been doing for thousands of years. That's why people have been using it to make bread, to make alcoholic drinks, because we know that this is what that yeast is designed to do. But if we give the yeast a different type of food, we gave it cornmeal, and again, I use just basic cornmeal from my kitchen, the sugar is there, the, but it's, it's bound up in a different way than the sugar is in just pure cane sugar, cane sugar. You can see this picture over here of the starch, where your glucose monomers are linked in a chain or a polymer, and that's what the, that's starch, that's what the sugar is bound in. And so the, the yeast, can't really digest it. It's like if the yeast is trying to take a bite of something, but it's too big to fit in its mouth. The same thing is going on with the other feedstocks I was working with, corn stover or ground up leaves and stalks from corn and sawdust. Um, in that case, there's still sugar. The plant has still converted the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere into sugar to make its body, but it's a different kind of sugar again, an even more complicated polymer. In this case, we call it cellulose. So in that case, the sugar is bound up and it's wrapped inside other chemical compounds in the cell wall. One of those is called lignin, which gives your plant some structure and makes it be able to stand up tall. And that lignin, a chemical, uh, compound is wrapped around the sugar. So the yeast in our bag, at least um, this general baker's yeast, doesn't have the ability to access the sugar that's in the bag. So that's why as you're noticing and you're making observations and looking at your experiment, that's why you might notice only one of them if you had sugar as a feedstock is really making much progress. But this leaves us with a big problem because we don't necessarily want to use our sugar cane or our cornmeal to make our biofuel. Going back to thinking about the corn ethanol, we don't want to take up land and resources to make a fuel um, out of something that could be used to feed animals or to feed people around the world. So we have this sort of puzzle. We know that the yeast is designed and does really well to ferment the pure glucose, the pure sugar, but the sugar in the plants and the other feedstocks that we want to use is more complicated. At the Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center, we have sort of a list of things that we want when we're thinking about what food stock or what plant should we use to make a fuel out of. And again, we want it to be something that's not food, 
We want it to be something that's perennial or grows back year after year. Why? Because when it does that, that's less energy and less resources for the farmers to replant. And that allows that plant to establish those deep root systems. One of the plants we use, you can see it in the picture here, is switchgrass. And switchgrass roots can get up to 14 feet deep beneath the ground. So that's a lot of carbon out of the atmosphere that's being taken into the plant and then put underground. Ideally, we'd want our, our feedstock to be native so that can support other, other benefits like the pollinators and the birds that live in the communities in which it'll be grown. We'd want it to be low maintenance, drought resistant, and not require a lot of fertilizers. And the last thing is we wanna grow these plants on what we call marginal lands. So that might be something where the soil isn't good enough to grow food crops on, or perhaps it's too hilly, or for whatever reason, this land isn't ideally agricultural, isn't an ideal agricultural land. So that's what we're looking at. So there's a lot of challenges with that. So as Allison mentioned, our ideal feedstocks are not in fact made up of these plain sugar monomers on their own, which are the most easy uh, option for yeast to digest. So that means that one of the main challenges that our scientists face, um, both that we and other scientists working on this, on this uh, study of biofuels, is figuring out how to make the sugar that is within cellulose and lignin and wrapped up in these more complex structures accessible to the yeast. So basically, how can we break it down into sort of bite-sized pieces that the yeast can then ferment more easily um, and create more ethanol or make biofuel more effectively? And one of the answers to that is the use of things like heat and enzymes called amylase, which basically function to break down these chains into smaller pieces, kind of like this image shows here, um, cutting it apart into, again, those more basic glucose monomers that the yeast can more easily digest. So that is something that they are working on in the labs and studying to see what is the most effective way of using things like heat and amylase to be able to break Break the, uh, break the sugars down. So of course, there are still so many questions left to answer, despite the great progress that has been made so far. Um, and a lot of different people are working on this uh, question of how to um, make biofuel that doesn't have to come from corn, that is from plants that are grown on marginal lands and drought resistant and all of the other features that Allison just made, and how to be able to break those down then um, using things like heat and enzymes to make them more accessible. Uh, to yeast. So those people who are pictured here um, on this slide include people who will work out in the field, people who will work in the labs, but also people like maybe economists or other people more in the business sector that study how um, biofuels will be kind of brought into the transportation realm in a more practical application sense beyond the science. So there's a lot of different ways that um, various people are helping to solve this question and to advance the science around biofuels. And we also wanted to highlight, in addition to all these different types of scientists, that there are so many different ways that people are taking action in climate change solutions. So if you're interested in learning more about what you can do to find climate change solutions, um, I just put a, a smattering of a few of the youth-led organizations that I could find on a quick search. Some of them are um, across the world, like the Sunrise Movement. Some of them are just here in Wisconsin, um, Dane County. So if you're interested, um, I encourage you to come back to this slide. We can share these with you and you can learn more about other, other groups that you can join and be a part of. So um, you don't have to try and um, head out on your own and thinking about what do we do about climate change? There are so many, so many different solutions and so many different pieces of the puzzle with the science and other actions. And I know we went through so much so fast today. So I expect that you probably have questions. And, and while you're putting those into the chat, I just wanted to thank you. Thanks for your time and for your attention today. You can learn more about the Wisconsin Energy Institute or the Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center here. If you're a teacher, 
Um, you can find this lesson and other lessons on our website that you can download. Um, so there's a lot of great resources out there. And of course, please feel free to contact me. Um, my email is right here if you have any questions or things you want to follow up on after. And it looks like we have some preliminary results back um, with the use of raw mashed sweet potato and cracker crumbs. Very creative. Very fun. And then surprised to see the sweet potato making more bubbles than the crackers. Yeah, that is interesting. Must be some sort of difference in the composition of and availability of the sugar in the sweet potatoes, and maybe just a higher concentration than in the crackers um, that the yeast like. And another thing that we like to think about as we do our experiments and learn from the scientists who are doing experiments in the lab is repetition and consistency. So I know that um, Alana and I will often have multiple bags of each feedstock so we can see what really is going on to make sure we didn't have any contamination between the bags and to try it again. So that's another thing that you can continue to experiment with um, with this setup. Yeah, I'm, I, I, she said, I think that mashing them up first really helped release the sugars. Yeah, that's a really important first step when our, uh, in the process of getting access to the sugars, they call it deconstruction. And like the physical deconstruction, grinding up the plants is actually one of the first and most important things that they do. In addition to those other more chemical um, processes that Alana was talking about with the enzymes. Oh, also, good question. If you leave or forget the bag on the counter, especially if you have one that's fermenting really well, one with just pure sugar in it, it will continue to ferment. So um, I recommend that you open it up and dump it down your drain or, or take care of it before you have it pop open in your kitchen. And just an interesting added point too on the mashing of the sweet potatoes. It is kind of um, similar to the process that we do as we eat our foods. I mean, when we chew them, that is the mashing of them and breaking them down mechanically, so into smaller pieces. And then we actually have enzymes like amylase in our saliva that then continue to work on breaking that down before it even enters our stomach, which of course is like where the main breakdown process occurs. So just interesting that we can kind of study um, what is going on in nature too as we are setting things up in experiments because a lot of answers lie um, in things that are naturally occurring if we can just observe those. So we're kind of recreating what the human and other animal bodies already do when we're mashing with a fork or something and then adding things like amylase in the lab. I have seen people try spitting or putting a little bit of saliva in their bags and seeing if that makes a difference. I think that's a really great thing to test. <laughs> Could do one bag with, one bag without. I've also seen people use different mushrooms that have um, enzymes or chemicals in them that might help decompose paper or other things to see if that helps too. So there, there are endless ways that you can roll with this experiment. All right, well, that seems like a great place for us to stop today. If you are thinking about this through your day and other questions come to mind, feel free to reach out either to Allison or Alana or to myself and I can get the questions so, to them if need be and we can answer them later if they come up. So um, thank you so much to everyone for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your days and hopefully we will see you at another presentation coming up. Bye.